Today we are going to get into lecture two uh, and finally get into kind of start to talk about uh, uncertainty, error analysis, statistical methods. We're going to look at basically z tables. We're going to look at Gaussian distribution, so probability. Hopefully you've seen this curve before. The width of your Gaussian is that standard deviation. There's some kind of mean mu value here, and we're going to get all into that uh, and enjoy uh, basically getting into how do we determine and look at uncertainty and calculate define confidence intervals and all of this good stuff. So um, before we get started into that, and actually related to this, um, whenever you're performing error and data analysis in the lab, there's a lot, there's, you know, there's a couple of common things that I kind of hear students um, over, you know, talk about when they're in the lab. Um, so a lot of time they'll ask each other, how good is your data set? So groups comparing data sets uh, to one another. How well does your experiment fit to theory? It seems to be a big focus for a lot of students um, in this course. What's the R squared value? Uh, and what's the percent error? So these are really well-intentioned questions, but these are not questions that we should be dealing with uh, as experimentalists, or not the proper questions. Um, so let's, talk, let's look at the first one. How good is your data set? What are you referring to again here? So remember, um, we spent a lot of time in the last lecture talking about um, precision, or like language, and being precise with your language. Uh, and not um, basically using these terms kind of correctly. So are we talking about the accuracy of our data? Are we talking about the precision of our data set? We need to be really, really clear. Data is not just good. Um, we need to kind of put it into the context of what we're studying. Um, is it accurate? Is it precise? Is it high resolution? Is your apparatus sensitive? Um, does it fit with your theory? You know, what are you talking about in terms of what do you think good data is? Um, so that's kind of one of the key things. And related to that, how well does your um, experiment fit uh, with theory? Well, let's think about that for a second. You know, it's great if your experiment fits with theory. Um, you know, hopefully that, <laughs> that always happens. But um, there's actually lots of times if it doesn't fit with theory, you might have a really new finding. And actually, that might be way better um, or much, much, <laughs> much better. Um, so instead, you want to kind of uh, talk about, well, OK, does your experiment fit theory? If it does, well, why is that? Or why should you expect that to happen? Are you studying this, a similar system? Should the phenomenon be the same? If it does, if it deviates from theory, why does it deviate from your theory, uh, theoretical? Is that theory applicable in this situation? Uh, are you finding some new uh, behavior? Or did was the experiment run incorrectly? Or is there uh, basically an uncertainty, whether it's precision or bias error, which we're finally going to talk to uh, in this video? Is it due to some error or illegitimate error that you performed in this experiment? That's what you kind of want to discuss and talk about. Um, what is your R squared value? Again, uh, again very well intentioned question, kind of hints at this accuracy and precision. However, we do not uh, shouldn't be too concerned with this R squared value. That's not kind of the life or death. Uh, again, I think it's um, you're kind of conditioned and taught that this R squared value, if it's not high, then your data set is, uh, is horrible. But and, and I've seen, you know, we talked about it last time in creating your uh, plots. I've seen a lot of students think that if their R-squared value is high, their data is good, and they'll get an A in assignment. No, 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 no. R-squared is just a measure of goodness of fit. Um, so if I have my data set, so Y versus X, so here, if I fit a line through there linearly, and that matches with your um, the theory, and your R-squared value is 0.89, Versus if you did a 12th order polynomial, your R squared is equal to 1. Again, a 12th order polynomial does not matter. The R squared only <laughs> is valuable in the context of if you're actually using the correct equation, again, that you're kind of comparing or developing or matching with theory. So R squared value is not life or death. R squared value, we're going to do much more thorough analysis than R squared uh, in this course. So we're not just going to stop at R squared and leave it at that. So um, don't be too obsessed with the R squared value. You know, and it's not just students, it's colleagues and other people, it's, you know, people who really seem to be conditional with that. We are going to be much more focused on your total uncertainty. So you, in some variable, u sub x, which can be a combination of bias error. We're going to see it's precision error in that variable. So our total uncertainty, that's the value I want you to be obsessed with. We want you to analyze that, explain that, put that in the context of your experiment. And finally, what is percent error? In this course, never, ever, 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 ever include percent error in any analysis that you perform. Um, I really don't like percent error. It's a meaningless analysis. It's usually percent error. I don't even want to write it, but it's the measured minus true over, you know, 
over true, you know, it does it doesn't it's it's a meaningless value because we're gonna see in a second. How do you ever know what is the actual or true value of a physical quantity being measured? Room temperature should be 25, but do we really know it should be exactly 25? No, you don't know it with any, you know, you don't know that you could actually, uh, exactly. We never know the actual true value uh, that's what we want, that we're being measured. We know the measured value with some uncertainty. And we're going to approximate and kind of see, okay, how well does that measured value approximate the true value with some degree of certainty or, uh, or uncertainty, uh, rather. So we are going to calculate, as you kind of see here, these confidence levels or confidence intervals. So confidence intervals. More on that a little bit later. So we are going to calculate these confidence intervals, and we'll say basically that when we have a measurement, you know, that, so for example here, if I have a measurement that should be, the X true should be, you know, I, I'm measuring some Young's modulus, let's say for aluminum, 69 gigapascal, that should be my Young's modulus. You never just leave it at that. It's going to be plus or minus some value, and that's going to kind of lead to this uncertainty. So plus or minus 0 0.1 GPA, for example. So that is going to be kind of the uncertainty. We never know it's exactly 69 gigapascal. It's going to be, it's going to vary, and it's going to, there's going to be un some uncertainty. Uh, and that uncertainty is going to be at different confidence intervals. We'll get back to that a little, lot later on. So there's lots of ways. Again, these are well-intentioned questions. Like, I don't want to stifle your, <laughs> your enthusiasm, but we want to kind of ask the right questions in this course. And there's lots of tools, again, in Mathematica that we are going to use, uh, MATLAB, uh, that we are going to use in order to use the statistical tools to perform error now. So, definition of error, even though I just said that we never really know the true value, but when you're just looking at error in general, it's just going to be that measured value minus the true value. Uh, and so we don't really, we always want to minimize this error. Uh, we want, again, high precision, high resolution, high accuracy, high sensitivity. That is our goal. But we'll, we're never going to, uh, that error is never going to be zero. We can never say that this is going to be 69 gigapascals plus or minus zero GPA. Never going to happen, ever, ever, ever in this course. Instead, we're going to say we know this value or we can, you know, we measure this value and there's going to be some bound on the air with some degree of confidence, 90, 95, 99%, 99.99. You know, you could do your Six Sigma black belt analysis uh, <laughs> on that air uh, and kind of kind of quantify it there. So, yeah, in terms of air, there are definitely different sources of air. Uh, in this course, we kind of define four broad categories. Precision air, bias air, illegitimate air, and airs that are sometimes biased and sometimes precision. Uh, these are actually really, really hard to kind of identify and deal with. But uh, in this course, um, and we'll see in the next coming lectures, we are going to focus on these guys primarily. And we're going to see why in a second. So this is going to be kind of for your exam and for moving forward. This is kind of, these are the most important airs, the most common airs, the ones we could use statistical tools um, or other methods in order to kind of estimate and quantify the air here. So precision and bias, get ready. These guys are going to be your friends. And we'll see why some of these other ones we're going to ignore or we might have already kind of um, basically accounted for them. So let's talk first about precision air. Um, sometimes they're called random air in literature. I really don't like that term. So uh, we're going to stick with uh, precision air. So what are precision airs? So precision airs are going to be different for each successive measurement. So if I gave, again, all of you a sample you know, let's say I gave a dog bone sample and I gave each of you a micrometer and I asked you to measure what is this gauge length right here. Um, each, you know, one of you might measure 0 0.137 um, millimeters, one of you might measure 6 millimeters. It's, there's going to vary, they'll vary slightly for each measurement. Um, you know, same thing with temperature as well. So if I gave you a thermocouple and I asked you to kind of even just measure the, you know, temperature, here's water. You have your thermocouple here. If I ask you to measure it, you know, some will measure 25.67 degrees C. Always put your units, 27.68 degrees C. It's going to vary uh, for each different measurement. So really, you're going to get, if we look at the probability of some measurement, let's say temperature. So let's say this is 5 degrees C. So in an ideal, again, if we think that the true value is 25, we should, in principle, in you know a perfect world, measure 25 each time. So our distribution should look like this. But in reality, it's going to look like this. It'll be centered around some of that mean, or close to that mean value, but there's going to be some width um, to this kind of measurement. Uh, and the reason is, again, there's experimental conditions. Or what? You know, let's look at why do we even have precision error. So 
well, obviously there can be some disturbances to the equipment. There can be um, sensitivity limits. So that hundredth of a degree, uh, yeah, you're really getting into, is your device even that sensitive to measure or, or does it have the resolution to kind of measure or to trust that, those values? Um, fluctuating experimental conditions, again, in a room temperature, it's oh, you know, the sun is always rising and falling. Uh, there could be AC issues. There's lots of kind of things that could happen. And really it's just kind of the st stochastic. Stochastic is a term that basically means random. So the stochastic nature of making measurements, even in static conditions, even in measuring your, uh, the gauge length, it's just, it's going to be a little slightly different each time. So there's going to be a distribution um, of those measurements and thus a distribution in the air. And we're going to see how we're going to calculate and account for that uncertainty in the air. So these are just going to be some examples. So measuring temperature, as I mentioned, the beam of micrometer. Um, even if you're measuring like the, I mean, it gets complicated in biology. If you're measuring the swimming velocity of bacteria, there's temperature fluctuations that could affect, you know, how they swim or, even, you know, uh, basically nutrient con uh, nutrient conditions. There's lots of different things that can go wrong, especially when you throw biology in the mix. Um, so that's kind of this idea of precision here. There's also the second type of error we're really going to be focused on in lecture five specifically. That's going to be um, propagating air, something very, very new that you probably haven't seen before. That is going to be kind of this bias or systematic error. Um, so again, systematic error, uh, it's much better than random, but uh, we are going to focus and use bias error. That term. The bias errors are going to occur the same way each time. So they will not have a distribution of error. So let's say the true value, um, and bias errors, like one of the best examples that I could give is like a, a scale that, went, that measures 0.5 milligrams heavier. So let's say my true value um, of my weight is 85 milligrams. That is definitely not true. <laughs> this is more like my dream weight. But anyways, let's say that that's my true value. Um, let's say my scale is always off by, you know, two kilograms. So bias errors are going to occur the same way each time. So they're going to be like this delta function when you look at probability. There's not going to be a distribution. It's always going to weigh, you know, plus or minus, you know, two or, you know, plus two uh, kilograms heavier. For example, the scale example. So that's exactly, they do not show a distribution. So we're going to have to form a different um, type of, not really statistical analysis, but propagating of errors. Um, so. This kind of uh, calibration error, which could have gone on for the scale, that's one of the most common types. Uh, there's lots of different bias errors. So calibration error could definitely be one of the suspects. This is just, again, that probability um, precision error distribution that we were show showing earlier. So calibration error could definitely be a um, factor there. Consistently reoccurring human errors um, is a really interesting one. So if you're uh, measuring an experiment and you're kind of like using a, a stopwatch, for example, to kind of give measurements as a function of time. This is, again, why you want to use data acquisition devices to remove this type of human error. But if you have someone, you know, a group mate that just always jumps the gun and reads a little bit earlier, that could, again, cause this bias error to occur. So if you read a little bit earlier, a little bit late, that can affect essentially the value that you uh, kind of measure. So defective equipment, again, kind of related to um, that kind of plus or minus, that offset error, that calibration error, for example. So these are kind of inter, oops, these are kind of interrelated. I don't know what I was trying to draw there. Um, Loading errors. So in a differential scanning calorimeter, you have basically a reference pan and a sample, uh, so F, sample pan uh, stage. So if you kind of, if you don't place them exactly kind of at the center here, and you have it, let's say, slightly off tilted, that could change essentially your, uh, when you're measuring heat flow, that delta H. So that can skew your measurements. And then of course, system resolution measurements. So if I have a, uh, Basically, let's look at a ruler. So if I have a ruler and this, the tick marks are centimeters, my bias error for this, you know, at this device is the plus or minus, I can't read better than plus or minus one centimeter. Um, some might do 0. 0.5 or 0. 0.3. Again, I like to be, I'm very cautious in my life and in measurements in general. So that's what we're going to deal with there. So let's talk a little bit about the other types of error that could occur in your experiment and why we are really focusing only on precision error and bias error for at least this first portion of the class. So there's a third type of error called illegitimate error. So illegitimate error um, will happen to you as an <laughs> when, you make, when you do an experiment. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to mess up experiments. You're going to create uh, computational or calculation errors, analysis errors. When this happens, you must, must perform the experiment or the analysis again. You can't present your results and just say it was illegitimate error or this uh, was caused by illegitimate error. That will not be accepted in this course. It's not going to be accepted uh, in industry or in academia. 
you must, you must, you must perform that analysis again or perform that experiment again. So we will not accept um, this was illegitimate error. Now you want to kind of say in your lab, if illegitimate error happened and you had to redo the experiment, explain that. But you cannot just leave it there like, oh, it was just illegitimate error. That will not be uh, accepted um, in this course or in real life, unfortunately. I wish we could just chalk it all up to illegitimate error. That'd be nice. Uh, but we cannot do that. Now, the last is um, a really difficult type of error to uh, kind of analyze and identify, which is errors that are sometimes biased and maybe sometimes precision error. So one of the things that we, if you're really, um, if you're very, very uh, uh, meticulous about kind of categorizing all types of precision and bias error, you probably have caught this error already in your error analysis. But these can sometimes like switch a mid experiment from being precision error to bias error. It's really, really kind of difficult to analyze and describe. So when you're doing really high um, resolution, high accuracy and high precision experiments where you need to measure like really, really small quantities or really difficult quantities to measure, you're probably gonna have to do a deeper analysis on this. Um, so they can include instrument uh, hysteresis. So it's basically it's this path dependent, so uh, measurements. So basically loading and unloading, you could kind of have precision error, bias error, and they could flip. Um, drift and variation in experimental conditions can cause this to become either a precision error or bias error. Um, and even just variations in procedures or definitions among your experimenters can cause um, this kind of really, really difficult error to pop up. So uh, we're not gonna worry too much about that, but uh, we will deal with that a little bit later on. Um, and actually we will talk about that more in the lab setting. Uh, in terms of how you want to approach and how you want to analyze this type of error. So next time we're going to look at uh, kind of total uncertainty. We're going to look more uh, into kind of identifying and kind of quantifying this error. And then finally, we're going to do some nice uh, actual problems to kind of solidify all of this. So I will see you all next time. Uh, thanks. Let me know if you have any questions. Have a great day. Steve, bye.